right. Okay, now you're gonna see a file there, and it's that, it's that uh, there in module six, it's that EO3H1 jobs, download that to your desktop, and uh, then rename it with your last and first name, and then we're gonna do some work with it today. And we're gonna work with it as well on Thursday, so we'll do some work today, and then you'll wanna upload that for today's, and then I'll save what we've done, and we'll start from there on, on Thursday. No, no, yeah, I'll have a screencast there for you because I'm gonna be at that conference thing. All right, I gotta wear a tie to that on business. It's not a pleasant experience. Anyway, yeah, okay, so it's 03H1 jobs. I have it there for you, so download it to your desktop. <clears throat> and once it's there, then rename it with your first and your last name. And that's the file. Now, bear in mind, if you take a look there, I mean, when you look at, at 448, page 448, that they probably have been doing some work with this in sequence. So we're, we're gonna be a little out of step with it, but that's okay. We'll do some different or some kind of improvisational things as well as just try to follow through the book. Uh, but we're gonna cover and do a little bit of work on charting and if you're logged in and you're following the screencast, you'll see I've just opened it up and we'll take a look at this, just basically how it's designed and all this business. This chart really is, this is this worksheet is, it's really not a worksheet as much as it is just kind of a, a place where I'm keeping some data. There's no computation that goes on or anything of that sort. You've got uh, basically some types of jobs, computer related jobs, then you've got uh, how many there were in 2010, then how many they estimate to be in 2020, the number of new jobs, the growth percent, and they may have computed that. No, they, they just inputted the data. So this is just a straight data file and then formatted into dollars, percents, or whatever is gonna be useful. Now we're gonna do some work with this first of all and click on G1, we're gonna go through the documentation part and uh, we're gonna put author, and the next, there in H1, uh, I'm gonna put my name, so we know who the author is. And then we'll, macros, we'll see if there aren't any macros in this. We'll put none. And then the third thing on documentation, what I want to do with this is click on cell, yep, click on cell uh, J1. And let's use that formula. You could use either equal, equal now, open parentheses, close parentheses, or equal today, open parentheses, close parentheses. So I'm, just, I'm gonna put, I'm lazy, so I'm gonna put equal now. And that will give me the date and I'll put that to the right of it. So far so good. Now just to set this off, so identify it to the end user, make it a little easier for them to spot. Take your cursor and put it on G1, and let's go all the way across over to um, K2, and we're gonna put some fill in there, and I'm gonna put a nice, dark green, kind of a dark green fill, doesn't matter. So you could do the accent and a lighter 40%, you could do it at a lower or higher percentage. I'm just gonna put it there. And then I'll bold those letters. And all that does is it just sets off. So if you look up there in the top, as we're starting to move down with our eyes, we see the title, computer related jobs. Then we see some documentation there that we've provided. And then we start to come into the, uh, we start to move into the, into the file or the data themselves, got it? Now, the authors gave us a file to work with that has some nice conventions on it or formatting or, or approaches. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Up here, they, they use a, a heading and then they have two subheadings. So the heading is number of jobs, then they have job growth, and then they have two subheadings. And then they have median pay and they have that for the year. 
2010, a subheading. So they've used it. Now where the authors didn't help us much is here in cell A3, there's nothing in there. There's nothing in A5. So if I wanna do some analysis with this, I'm gonna to have to do a little bit of adaptation for the, so I have a true fly, uh, data array that I can work with. So click on cell A5, okay? And we're gonna put uh, job title, okay? And then click on cell B5, and we're gonna put 2010 job level. Or put, uh, let's put 2010 number of jobs, so we stay at that theme. It's gonna be a little bit of jobs. You said, now wait a minute, you've got that up there already. The reason we're doing this is when we get ready to do something like filter and sort this, or we get ready to create a chart, when we have an array like this, it's broken up or has sub subheadings on it, it becomes a little bit problematic to work with. So uh, we're gonna stick with what we're doing here. And we've got job uh, 2000, 2020, estimate and we'll, we'll add in a number of jobs so we stay consistent with the theme and then we have the job growth a number of new jobs and percent uh, growth and oh, they're on E5 I'm going to put percent growth in new jobs And then we have 2010, and I'm going to put 2010 median pay. Okay. Now, right now, what we did there on row five is indeed a little bit redundant for a presentational style. But if we want to do this for, if we want to use it for analysis, we have to have an intact array, and we really need to have one that's intact that includes labels or headings or variables, dimensions, whatever term you might want to use, it applies, okay? So right now we've got this array and I'm gonna highlight, I have A5, okay? I'll start over there at A5, all the way over to, um, down here to F12, follow? Now, I'm gonna go ahead and do a little bit of format work with that and I'm gonna put and I'm gonna click all borders. And so I went up there to the borders area. Okay. And I click all borders. And that just looks a little bit nicer to me. Now below here is is documentation for the data, where it came from. And so what I want to do is I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna bold that up. It's an italic, but I'm gonna bold it up a little bit. And I'm going to bring it back up to about a nine in terms of size. Okay. So far, so good. So let's walk through this real quickly. I've got the title of this, we've got the title of this uh, of this uh, tab, and then I've got the documentation area. That's the little green area over there. These are these macro, what I call macro headings or level one headings for the data. And they're nice, they look pretty, but they're not good for analysis. So I went ahead and I made these, I, um, I, I made each of these subheadings more telegraphic. And we wanna make sure that everything's showing on them, so pop it out there. Because we're not that too concerned about the, the, uh, the width of this, because we got plenty of room. Make sense? So far, so good? Now, if I wanted to, I could add some aggregation to this, meaning I could come down here, for example, and I could take, I can insert a row in between, uh, I could insert a row there in between the source and the data administrators, and I could put some totals in. So I'm gonna click insert. It looks like there was a row 13 there anyway, it was hiding. And I'm gonna pull it back out here. Hmm, strange. 
What have I got hidden here? Let's unhide this and say, well, weird. Fourteen. Let's see. On, we're doing a little bit of improvisation here to kind of work it through it a little bit more. They're on a, and I guess row 14, I guess they hid, 13's hidden in there. Let's see if I, there's 13, there's our friend. So click on 13 and size it out a little bit, and then we'll get rid of 14. I'll delete it. Now on, on 13, I'm gonna put totals. I'm gonna put it in all caps. Okay. And now I'm ready if I want to, to simply use the sum function to get the number of new jobs for 2010. So I'm gonna put my cursor on six and I'm gonna scroll all the way down to the totals and then I'm gonna look up on the far right side, I'm on the home tab, on the far right side I'll see auto sum and boom. Got it? So I took, this, I took that, file, uh, that row 13 that was hidden, I exposed it, and then I put in a totals row. Now, I've got the totals in, I've got the totals in, that term totals in caps, so let's make it bold so it sets itself off, off a little bit. And then let's go ahead and take our cursor and go from cell A1, A13, all the way over to E13. And I'm gonna put in the fill. Yeah, I'm gonna use that nice blue fill that we were using, it looks like. A little darker hue, no, it's too dark. I think that's gonna be close. I'll stick with that. Because it sets it off a little bit. So I've got the totals there. And then it's just simply a matter of I just drag and drop across to get the sum totals. So what I have there now are the sum totals in terms of the 2010 number of jobs, the estimated number of jobs in 2020, and the number of new jobs in terms of job growth. Now we move to some percentages, all right? And we're gonna use the average for those. So we'll put equal average, okay? And we're embellishing this a little bit, but that's okay. And then, now on the median pay, Median pay is, median is already a summary statistic, so it's not, I, I don't know that it's really necessary for us to get the median of the median or the average of the median. It's kind of nonsensical, so we'll just leave that blank, okay? So far so good? Now I did this for a simple reason. By adding in that row and putting in the total, and to, putting in those aggregate data, if I want, a, a, an end user or a, a reader can look at this and say, okay, I see the totals. I kind of get it. You with me? Now, if I want to, I could come over here and I could also provide some aggregate data on the rows, but it's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be confusing <laughs> simply because I'm going to be mixing types of data, and so there's really no need to do a right-hand side on this, or pardon me, a vertical. Got me? So I've just got this horizontal. So a person can look at the bottom here and they can see, they can see the totals and they can see them by year. Now, if I, now the, the authors want us to do some charting and all that business, but what I always say is the first thing, once we've got some aggregate data, if we don't have them, is to go ahead and say, is there a simpler way than drawing a chart to depict these data in a comparative fashion? And is there? What would be, what's a tool here that would help me show these data in relative terms? Yeah. 
you buddy? Something that's real simple that lets me compare them. Well, let's take our cursor on the number of jobs and put it on, put it on A6. And let's highlight A6 through A12, okay? And then let's click on conditional formatting. Did you click on conditional formatting? Now, let's think about this for just a minute. If you look at that, you're gonna see, I've got, I've got some rules I can highlight cells if they meet a certain criterion, okay? Or if I want, I can do some top and bottom <laughs> rules. I can show the top cells versus the bottom cells. This is gonna be, of course, in terms of the values. I can use data bars, or I could use color scales, or I could use icon sets. I have a lot of options. So the authors here, when they leave out this tool as far as a charting tool, in my opinion, yeah, have you want to jump out into jump out ahead of yourself when maybe there's just a more simpler way to depict the data? Okay, it just depends on what you want to do. And you could see we've talked about before the way these are designed. I've got a big tab, and then I have a sub tab below it, and then I have that tree. And let's click on the highlight cell rules for just a minute. Let's see what we got. Okay. Greater than, less than, between, equal to, text that contains the data occurring, duplicate values, I've got even more rules. I can apply some rules here if I care to. I can do some top and bottom rules. The top 10 items, the top 10%, the top, the bottom 10. Above average, above average below average. I can highlight those. Okay. Then the data bars are kind of helpful. I want to talk about them for just a second because they do involve an aesthetic issue. And if you look on the data bars, click that, and then you'll see there's two types of fill. One is the gradient fill, and the other is a solid fill. The gradient fill is probably the one you want to use for a simple reason. A user can see a number behind that gradient. So it's not just blocking out the number. You follow me? Kind of like when we, when we did the, um, put a bookmark in a document. You could see the document, but you could see that bookmark under there. Same thing with the, great, uh, with the data, uh, data bars, if you use the gradient field. Now I like color scales for a very simple reason. People understand them. They understand green, red, yellow. They don't obey them, but they know them. Okay. And I know typically green is better, yellow is a caution, red is eh, eh, eh. I can do, I have some other combinations there for rules I want to choose or add. It's just up to you. The key thing is how many cases are you dealing with, i.e. how many records. So the authors are going to walk you through just for the sake of argument and show you how to do some charting, and we're, we're, we're going to do that. But for all intents and purposes, the simpler the better, especially when you have a small number of data. I'm looking at, I don't know how many records, six to 12, so I've got seven records basically. Is it really worth it to put up a gigantic chart? I don't know, or even draw one. But if, it, if you can use a conditional formatting, okay, to convey the same information, if you're doing comparisons, if you'll notice those, if you look, I've got the click on format on the for, conditional formatting. I have two kinds of conditional formatting, format approaches. One is I compare stuff, okay? The second is I create a criterion, the top 10%, the lower 10%, those above average, those below average. It just depends on what I want to depict, okay? Where this will be most helpful for, helpful for you will be, say for example, in a meeting where you're looking at division sales. You got six divisions in the company and you folks in your meeting with your compatriots, your colleagues, and you're 
trying to figure out, okay, how we, uh, how do we get a picture or a snapshot or a look at these folks in context, i.e. how they're doing versus each other? Well, you've got some choices there. Now I'm going to try the conditional for the color scales for a moment. Okay. And I'm going to do just the straight green, red, yellow. Now this is simplistic. Okay. But it gets the job done. Doesn't it? It shows me uh, who had the higher number of jobs, the lowest and those kind of in between. So this is a, what we would call a descriptive use of conditional formatting. If I want to make something that's prescriptive or I want to draw a conclusion or apply a criterion, I can highlight those cells that are above 10 the top 10% or the lower 10% or those that are between a certain value, whatever. It just depends upon what I want to choose. You follow me? If you get a, if you have a, a large number of records, and I would say, what do you say? What do you mean by a large number of records? Anything over 15 to 20 records, this starts to break down because it tries to to to, to uh, the, the cuts get too fine. And let, even here, you could see where that deteriorates. Take a look at what I've got here. Now, it's easy to see I've got some green, yellow, and red, right? And it's easy to see the difference between the green and the red. But between those yellows, and notice how it goes from kind of a, a yellow to kind of an orange. See the gradient there as it goes? The eye may catch it or it may not. And it tells you something in terms of you're moving from those that are closer to the green versus those that are closer to the red. But for all intents and purposes, if you have too many records there, it starts to lose it starts to lose its meaning. And this may not have much meaning to anybody anyway. You got it. Imagine if this was sales of, 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 of six products that you have or, or the sales of six divisions you have or whatever. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to back out of that for just a second. And I'm going to do the conditional formatting and I'm going to do highlight cell rules. And I'm, I'm going to come out here, the top and bottom rules, and I'm going to highlight the top well, let's see, top 10% uh, and the top 10%, I'm gonna format them, I'm on the dialog box is green. See how I got there? I'll back up and do it again. I'm gonna click conditional formatting, top bottom rules. And I'm gonna come down here to the top 10%, click that. And then you'll see the top 10% and a formatting I can use. If I want, I can up the font. If I want, I can change the fill and the text. So here, since this is the top 10%, I'm going to make them green fill with green text. And there's my top 10%. Again, now, if I had a whole bunch of records here, records meaning rows, this makes a lot of sense. If I don't, you with me? So before you launch into charts, it's always a good idea to ask yourself, what am I really trying to depict and how many records do I have? Now, it works in the opposite. There are gonna be those cases where you're gonna have so many records that a chart is gonna be difficult. And that's gonna be the situation where you'll, you'll have a whole bunch of records and you chart them and then you'll need to copy the chart and put it into another tab so it makes makes sense. So you can have you can see the thing, and it do, it doesn't obscure the data. You always want, if you can, to show the data. Okay, we're going to cancel that off, and now we're going to do something. First of all, once I've done that, the second thing I do is I start to look at that in terms of the trying to do some another analysis in terms of sorting them. So highlight cell A5 over to F12, okay? 
and then come over to the side and you're gonna see sort and filter. Come down and you'll see custom sort. Did you find it? Yes? You'll notice I'm not going step by step by step by step in the book. If you want to do that and get the file, do it, be my guest. Yeah, uh, monkeys can do that. <laughs> if you want to understand what you're doing, stay with me on this because I can show you some shortcuts just simply because I've done this enough, I know what they are and then know how to handle them. So we're gonna do a custom sort. So click on that and the custom sort dialog box pops up for us and I've got the, I can sort them by, and I have these different columns named. Make sure on the far right hand side, it says my data has headers and it's checked. Is it? Okay, so we're in good shape there. So I wanna get the, uh, I wanna sort these on the basis of number of new jobs. And I'm going to sort them on values because they're numbers. And then I have a choice as I come over here. I can either do the largest to the smallest or the smallest to the largest. I can either put them in ascending or descending order. Since I'm interested in the job numbers and the job growth and all that, it appears that's something I'm wanting to find out and look at. I'm going to put them in largest to smallest and let's see what happens. Okay. And there they are, right for us in terms of the number of new jobs. And so we see that software application developers, they have the highest number of new jobs. And so, okay, that's great. What if I'm interested in the pay? Well, I can run what I call a, ter a secondary analysis of this. So click on sort and filter, go back to custom sort. Now we've run a primary sort, which is the first one, and as we work through the machine, it's gonna do that primary sort, then it'll do the secondary sort, and then a third, which we call a tertiary sort. So we're gonna do a secondary sort, and I'm gonna click add a level. And this time I'm gonna click on median pay, 2010 median pay, median pay, and I'm gonna go from largest to the smallest. And let's click okay. And there we are. Now we have something interesting to look at, and because we have so few records, it's fairly comprehensible. It's easy to look here and see, yeah, okay, the number of new jobs, the big, the big growth in terms of the number of new jobs is gonna be software application developers. But the highest median pay is over for folks who are CIS managers, okay? You don't leave school and become a CIS manager. You probably have been in the field five to 10 years, and that's why they're making uh, twice, or 30 or 40% above the median uh, you know, you know, with the software app developers, but those folks are CIS managers, they're making a little bit more money, probably because they've got an experience factor built in. But if you're looking at the entry level positions, that's a whole different matter. Software app developers, programmers, database administrators, systems analysts. Now I will, I will make my my this this class this semester. I'm with you on my my on and on encouragement to say, don't let some little numbers scare you. There are probably there's probably an accountant hiding in some of you. There's probably a computer scientist hiding in front of some of you. And all I can say is if you come down to the end of uh, four years and you don't have something out there, you may not have applied the time you need to be looking for a position that you should have. We have a career a placement over here at OBU. Another way you could do that is through internships, practicums, you can target companies, try to get an internship with them. Enactus is a pretty good source of that. 
a, a way to get out there and meet people. Um, I would say right now that, well, let me tell you kind of what happens. At the end of four years, the computer science students usually have a job or they're one waiting on it. The same with the accounting students. And then for everybody else, it depends on how hard they've worked at identifying an employer or an industry and going after it. Okay? If you're a management major or a marketing major and you were to ask me, Dr. Harmon, what would you suggest? I would say look at the field of logistics for a simple reason. That's what makes the global economy work. Without logistics, I don't care how much stuff you buy from Amazon, if you don't get it, you don't get it. If it doesn't get there on time, it does you no good. Those folks are looking for people, and I'm not saying go out and be a UPS driver, although for some of you it might be an adventure that you enjoy and a learning curve and a learning experience. Those folks that do those jobs are extremely skilled at what they do. But those, there are also many smaller companies who are looking for folks who aren't afraid of numbers and who are willing to work hard and who would like to have a future where they can make a difference in people's lives. And often you can. Getting them that stuff on time or intact is a big deal. All the people all you're traveling with last, this, this last summer when we were over in Europe, people were buying stuff. And rather than the old days when you toured Europe, you, you carried this big, you carried all this stuff with you and you prayed that it wouldn't get, you know, wouldn't get broken. Well, today the TSA's eliminated all that because you have a certain number of pounds and then you pay a penalty. So you send the stuff FedEx. Can you imagine buying something in Florence, Italy and hoping it'll arrive at your house that is magic, but it, it's people like you who are intelligent, who can handle numbers, who aren't scared of them, who are willing to say, okay, I like to be in, I'd like to be in a job where I can really provide some meaning or help the people. So there's some great opportunities out there in logistics, supply chain. I would strongly, strongly encourage you to do that if you haven't looked at that. I'll give you one other advertisement. Can anybody tell me the company that hires more college graduates than anybody in the world? No? No? Enterprise Rental. Now, I realize if I say Enterprise Rental, you go, four years of school and I do that? Well, I've had many students who took my advice, went to work for them, some that stayed with them, and now they run their own store basically at an airport or wherever they work long hard hours but they're knocking out six figures but the others if you work for them for a while and you have a good relationship with them and, you, and then you leave on good terms you have something on your resume that's quite important it's called branding branding my wife has an art degree from southwest baptist <laughs> took a couple of office administration courses she worked for it with fedex for 15 years and people are still calling, and we've been living here for 12 years. You want that branding on your resume, a Fortune 100 firm's brand on your resume that you've worked for them, or even if you did a couple of internships, is of great value. But enterprise is a great place to work. You learn how to deal with the public, you work retail hours, you demonstrate to them or to future employers, you're willing to put forth the effort it takes to do well and to do well for the company. And I didn't make the rules, but here are the rules. You're entering the most competitive job market in the history of the world. You're competing against people from all over the world. Because of the internet, the ability to connect people, folks can work from remote, from anywhere. So you wanna leave here ready to confront that and deal with it and be successful. And that's also going to be those moments when somebody says to you, you know, we need to have you stay for the weekend. Uh, we have a project. Or, you, or your boss on the evaluation says, it looks like you just do the minimal amount. Is there a reason why you maybe don't try to do a little extra? And if your answer is, well, it's because you haven't asked me, your boss will in their mind go, I don't have a live one here. 
if you go out there and you say, I'm going to think like the owner of the business, you're going to go far. Trust me, you will. Okay. So we've got this, this here chart we're working with. We've done a little bit of sorting with it. Uh, and we did a primary sort and a tertiary sort. We'll go back here to the custom sort. We'll select that range there. And there it is. I could add a third level on this sort if I wish to. But I've got the number of new jobs and the median pay. So I'm chasing a job, okay? I mean, even are out there, what's the highest number? And then what's the one, what's the one that has the highest pay levels? Well, they're different. And probably the one that's the highest is certainly gonna be driven by experience. So far, so good. Now I've done all of this before I did any charting. The authors over here in 448 and 449, they launch you right into doing charting, but this is the routine I follow, okay? I make sure that I have a data set I can work with. And then number two, I do a little bit of preliminary work with it to kind of get a feeling for it. I'm with you so far? Yes? All right, let's do a little bit of charting, okay? So we're gonna, I'm gonna highlight cells. So I'm gonna start with the array A5, and I'm gonna come all the way over to F12, okay? And then I'm gonna click Insert. Now, if you, if you look over here, and you're gonna see if you come over to the middle, you're gonna see the charts. All types of charts you can use. Recommended charts, pie charts. You with me? It depends upon the data you're gonna, you, you intend to depict in terms of what you want to, pro what you want to use. And I'm gonna just come over here and I'm gonna click on recommended charts. The authors walk you through that over there in this exercise. And they're giving us a fairly complex chart. It's a clustered bar chart, meaning we've got things clustered together by job. So let's click OK on that. And let's take a look at it. Now, every chart's gonna have the following elements. And if I wanna add some stuff to the chart, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna click on format, pardon me, I'm gonna click on design. And then if you come to the far right, you'll see a thing that says add chart element. Did you see that? Yeah? Now, chart's gonna have the following. A chart title. You'll see the prompt that's right there at the top. It's gonna have a, a primary, it's gonna have a title for the, the uh, Y axis, the vertical axis. It's gonna have a title for the X axis. It's going to show you the data series and so it's clustered those variables, median pay, growth, uh, estimated number of jobs in 2020, 2010 the number of jobs per job title. So I have this, now this down here is the legend. And I could add, again, I could add a vertical title, Horizontal title, what, what are those numbers? What do they mean? And that's the problem with this type of chart is because I'm clustering together some different kinds of things. This is not where I'm, like I'm clustering the sales of different products for different divisions. I've got some mix and match stuff here, but that's okay. Let's click inside of it. And the first thing I wanna do is I'm gonna copy it. Okay, so I'm gonna click it. copy. Okay, and I'm gonna add a new worksheet. And then I'm gonna come over here to cell C2 and I'm gonna paste. And there's my chart. 
okay? Now I'm gonna do something very, very dramatic here. I'm gonna rename sheet one. What do you think I should rename it? Chart, okay? Is that inventive? Chart. Now on Outlook, I'm gonna name that, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna rename it data. Isn't that amazing? Now, I'm also going to add some color to these tabs. And on the data tab, I'm gonna make that uh, tab color, I'm gonna make it dark green, as you guessed. And then on chart, what color will I make that? The tab color will be what? Gold, exactly, green and gold, see? So I have the data in one place, I have the chart in another. Now if I wish to, if, if, if it's my desire to add the data, I can go ahead and do that. But it's pretty clear to the reader or an end user, Here, here's the raw data. And this chart, this chart here I've got, just cut it, get rid of it. The other one's still there. You say, why'd you put it over here in this other, in this other tab? Well, this lets me size it up some. Now, since I'm working with a bar chart, okay, I want to enlarge it so it's a little bit easier to work with. Follow me? Now, this is a, is a nice chart, but it's too complex. It's too big, complex because it's got each of those variables there clustered per job title. Now, I'm going to click inside the chart and I'm gonna click design. And if you far, see in the far right, pardon me, the far left of the ribbon, you're gonna see it says add chart element. I'm gonna click okay. And I'm gonna give axis title and I'm gonna choose the primary vertical title. See how I got there? And this will be my primary vertical title. And I'm going to call it, I'm going, to, I'm going to come up here in the formula bar, I'm going to type up there, and I put job title. Now, you'll want it, you'll want to customize it, and I'm, let's see, I'm going to click on it again, and then click home, and I'm going to bold it, and I'm going to make it all oh, about a 14. <laughs> Well, I think I'll do that. Um, yep. Let's see. Yeah, I don't know. Do I want to do that or not? Click it and right click it and then let's do, 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 do the style, the font, and let's make that a regular. Let's up the font to about a, a, a 14, 13. You can stop at 12 if you want. That's gonna be okay. And then I wanna look here on the font color and I'm going to stick with a nice dark blue. With me everybody? I'll click okay. And there's the job title. Now down here, we have numbers, which are basically incomprehensible because they mean different things. <laughs> but I've got the cluster effect that I want. So I might wanna click here and get rid of that axis. So I'm gonna delete that axis. And now this makes more sense. You see what we did there? The numbers are nonsensical because I'm mixing percentages and numbers. These clusters, remember, are from each chart. So we've rendered it out so we can see the programmers. And you say, now why wouldn't you put the numbers there? Well, if you want to really junk this up and make it look really nasty, you can. Or a person can simply put their cursor there 
and they'll see the number. Okay? Now, this is okay. It's not too bad. As far as an aggregate chart goes, and I have to do a little bit of work if I want to compare the job titles, I can't do as well. Now, imagine if I had 50 or 100 records, what I would do with this, this would become an unwieldy beast. So I would probably need to go back here and click on data. Let's say that I had, oh, 50 job titles that I was analyzing these data. So I had 50 job titles and I had the number, and then I had these figures across left to right. I've got 400 pieces of, 200 pieces of data I've got to depict. At this point, I probably need to do a series of charts as opposed to a clustered chart so that it makes sense. Meaning I might want to choose just one variable. Okay, so let's do this. Click inside the chart, uh, click and uh, highlight cells A5. I'm back in the uh, data tab, A5 to F12. And I'm doing a little improv improvisation, but that's okay. Click insert. And then we're gonna click insert and we're gonna chart. And I'm gonna come over here on, da, 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 da. let's see. Um, insert statistic, I don't wanna do that. Hierarchy, no. Let's stick with a column or bar chart. And we're gonna do a 2D, 2D column, the very first one. Okay? So I clicked, in, I, I highlighted the array A5 to F12. Then I clicked insert. And then I chose this type of bar chart, the 2D, two dimensional bar chart. Okay? Now it has all of the data. You with me? But still, I've got too much. I can't put this into perspective unless I decide to size this chart up. So take the gra grappling hook and let's just take it all the way out here and let's size up. Then we can see things distinctly. If I have to do this, what does this mean it's time for me to do? Add another tab. Okay. That's why I had the tabs so I can, I can see the data there. Now this makes some sense. It shows me the number of jobs, the estimated number of jobs. And if you look at this, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna create a new sheet and I'm gonna call it chart. I'm gonna rename it and I call it chart two and put C-H-A-R-T-2, okay? And I'm gonna add a color there. And let's see, I'm gonna the tab color. I'm going to use, let's see, what would be a good color? I'm gonna stick with red to celebrate the Cardinals return to postseason play. I have chart two, and I can take chart two and I can move it behind chart one. And now I'm ready to go back into the data area and I can click copy and then go to the chart two area and click paste. And now I have this sized out enough that it makes some sense. I could add the chart title if I want I can, I, I can go ahead and I don't need, I can add the chart title 
I don't really need to do anything with a vertical tile or a horizontal tile because it's pretty self-explanatory. Okay. Let me say this. I realize this may not be the most exciting material you're going to cover today or maybe the entire semester, but if you can take data and depict them properly and in a way that makes sense, it's going to be helpful to you just in terms of the decision making because you're going to get paid to make decisions. But number two, it's going to be helpful to you in terms of how you share your ideas with your colleagues. And if you become known as somebody who can take a set of data and present it in a way that we all understand it, i.e. it's actionable data, I can make a decision, then you've really gone far. And I'm just going to tell you now, you're going to be doing reports and those kind of, and, and, and presentations the rest of your career. If you're afraid of doing that, you need to go find something else to do. It's just the way it is. It never ceases to amaze me, particularly, I'm not gonna say which group of our students it is, but these are these brainiacs, and then they're asked to do a presentation, they can't make a presentation. They can't do a chart, but they can do all kinds of wizardry. I feel badly for them. Because they're, they're not gonna look good when it comes time to the boss is sitting there with everybody else and they've gotta do their presentation. And it, how many of you are having classes where you're asked to do presentations? Anybody? Don't make this as odious task. Make it a, an opportunity to hone your skills. How many of you can tell I'm from Oklahoma in terms of my accent? Obviously, when I lived and worked up north, I thickened it. I really made it really thick. So people think, well, he's just some big, dumb Okie. To my advantage, I wanted them to think that. So this is a nice chart here. I can put a good title on, and now I can compare all these data. The rest of this over here, the quick analysis, you'll want to take a look at that. Although I don't know, you know, What I do is before I make a chart, if I have a set of data, is I plan out what I want to what I want to do. And I try to say to myself, okay, what am I trying to do here? Now let's look at this chart that we've got here, this in chart, chart number two. And I want to ask you something. Would it be easy for me to figure out which job title? has the highest number of estimated jobs for 2020. Is that easy to see? What tells me what those levels are? I've got a bar there, right? And it's a particular color, correct? So I can see. How about the number, uh, how about the number of jobs in 2010? because the bars, the clustered chart has to be sized out enough that you see and comprehend the clusters. When you get, when you get beyond, let's look at this for a minute. Think about it like this. I've got these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven types of jobs, okay? And I've got one, two, three, four, five variables. So I've got 35 variables I'm depicting. job times some numeric measure, job type times some type of numeric measure. Right? So once it gets too clustered, I have to be very, very careful, but I can see it here. Now, if I want, I can add data labels. Let's click on the orange bars and let's add data labels. 
You click on that right click, you'll see it says to add data labels. We can do that, right? Or we can do call outs. Let's do the call outs. Sweet, huh? Much prettier. Now, if I were doing a report, in other words, a static report that I was sending somebody, I'd, I'd send this, I'd do a screenshot, print screen of this, and send it to them. Here's this, here's the call out set for this variable, this variable, this variable, this variable. So I have a clean picture each time. If I'm doing a presentation, I could do the same thing. Then I can just delete those and I could do the call outs for the next one. And the next one, the next one. So they can see the data. If I'm collaborating with people, same story. Those are the three situations where you're going to be either presenting in a static format, i.e. report, or number two, you're going to be doing a presentation where you're doing it on the fly or on the fly with other people as you collaborate and take a look. They may have, the, they'll have this same file and they may say, I think I'll take a look at the call outs on these others. Does this make sense? So it's, 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 it's more, it's more than just doing some keystrokes or doing a series of steps. It's thinking your way through. There's some aesthetics involved in this as well, i.e. the art of this, this right here that I've got depicted, that's laid out beautifully. I can see the data. I can get a sense of the data because I'm looking at the charts, how high they are versus each other. I've got the raw numbers there. And I can do that for each one of these variables. Now, what I would probably do now, if, if I'm through with that, just click, leave, leave the call outs there. And let's click, click down here in that very bottom with the number of jobs and all that. And let's format that. Let's format that uh, legend. And uh, da, da, da. Uh, let's see, do I want a shadow glow or soft edges? My legend options, I want to the top. I've got where I want it to be, so I'm good there. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at the, the fill. It has no fill right here, so I don't know. I'm probably gonna gook it up if I, if I put a fill in it. So leave it there and go up to home, you're on the home button and just click bold. And then let's up the uh, size of that font to about a 10.5. Ah, that nice? I put my title on top. And it might be something like, let's just call it Job Outlook. Uh, computer science. Positions. 210 to 2010 to 2020, 2010 to 2020, okay? And then click enter, and there it is. That's not too bad, and I can take, I'll use my grappling hook, and I'm gonna move this over a little bit away. So I'm away from those call outs. Isn't that nice? Nicely done chart, the call outs are nice. And I can do the cost for the other variables. Page 453 shows you a table, 3 3 shows you some chart elements. Um, figure 3 2 2 there at page 452 shows you how to, shows you doing a combo chart, which we've basically done a clustered chart. Um, some more data about formatting charts. Look, it's just gonna, once you kind of have the basics down for doing this, and you understand some of these design principles, for all intents and purposes, it just becomes a matter of 
of what you do to, to kind of, uh, you know, add the bells and whistles, polish it, get it to where it looks good. It's going to depend upon the data, the situation, but it should always tell a story. And I can see there's a story here. For the person who responds to number of these callouts, I'm going to look over these callouts and see these figures. And I would even probably want to bulb them up a little bit. But I can also look, if I really just want to take a quick glance, I can look at the bars and I can see how high the bars are, and they tell me. Is that fair enough? Save this, okay? and upload it for today, for, for the work that's due today. And you wanna save it on your, uh, on your uh, I've got on my PC, then on your desktop. And make sure you have it over on your desktop. And I'm gonna call, and I have mine, uh, the, the net file name and then Harmon Keith, and I'm gonna put this, um, today is 10-1-1-2019. Okay, and so I know I did it today. I'll upload this over there and then we'll do some work with it. Do some more work with it when, when I, I'll do some more work with it when I do the screencast for you for Thursday, okay? All right, folks, thank you so much. A little bit of work done. I'll have this ready for you, the, this uh, screencast and then the other one. I'll uh, get it done, I think, hopefully maybe tomorrow, tomorrow night. But you have the following, you have the file, you have the screencast, you have this lesson if you care to go step by step by step by step. But remember, they may start you assuming that you've been doing some prior work. Fair enough? Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it.